We've been going through a series of messages uh, discovering who the Father is. We know so much about Jesus, the Son. We know so much about the Holy Spirit. We're learning, but we're also learning who the Father is. And it's based on a scripture, for, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, where God says, I will be a father to you, and you will be my sons and daughters. How many sons and daughters do we have here today? You're not illegitimate. You're not orphans. You're a child of God. Amen. And so in this study, it's been great to learn the heart of the father and uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the training of the father and the names of the father and the identity of the father. Pastor Chris did a great job last week on the father wound, the, the, the father fracture, if you will, that we sometimes have a bad experience maybe with an earthly father and then we project that onto God, our Father, and it, it stunts our spiritual growth. Well, today I want to continue this process of discovery and talking about this dimension of the Father that can seem uncomfortable, but is so very important for us, understanding how much God loves us, how much he cares for us, and it's the area of discipline and training. And I want to talk to you about the process that God brings us through to raise us up and make us mature. Because in the process of causing us to become strong sons and daughters, sometimes our loving father has to allow us to walk through hard experiences in life. Those are the times where we may say, God, where are you? And what kind of a God are you doing? Why am, why am I going through this? And we have to look behind and see that it's his love, his great love, and what he's up to is he's raising us up to be strong, mature sons and daughters. Today, my subject is entitled, Responding to Divine Discipline. And I want us to look at Hebrews chapter 12. This is about 15 verses. And we'll have this for you on the screens, I believe. And I'm going to read to you from the New Living Translation. But allow the Holy Spirit, as I read these beautiful scriptures to you, to speak something fresh and new that's for your life and maybe what you're going through right now. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. Everyone say Jesus. The champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding the shame. Now he is seated in the place of honor besides God's throne. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. And then you won't become weary and give up. After all, you have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. And have you forgotten the encouraging word? How many could use an encouraging word today? Have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children when he said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline and don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those that he loves. Now, let me just put a pin in this right here. We're going to keep reading this passage, but I really, it's so important to magnify this word love because if we miss this love thing, we're going to misunderstand this entire message. That's the most important verse, uh, most important word in this entire passage. Everybody say love. Do you believe today that God loves you? Do you believe he cares for you? I don't know if you have a, a mother that you really love or a child that you would do anything for. Maybe you have a pet <laughs> that you just, you just love. Maybe for you it's chocolate. It's all about chocolate. <laughs> you just love it. I don't know what you love or how you feel about certain things in life, but I want you to know God loves you a trillion times more than you love your children. And that's an intense love. I, I feel love for my children. I love my grandchildren. God loves us so strong. And if we, if we 
take this subject on about God correcting us and we don't understand the love piece, we're really gonna get this wrong. So I want you to say this with me out loud. God loves me. He really does. Okay, so we continue. He says, uh, he disciplines those he loves and he punishes each one that he accepts as his child. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own sons and daughters. Whoever heard of a child who's never disciplined by his father, if God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and not really his child at all. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirits and live forever? For our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years at doing the best they knew how, but God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable when it's happening. It's painful. But afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. So take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall but become strong. Work at living in peace with everyone and work at living a holy life for those who are not holy will not see the Lord. Look after each other so that none of you fails to receive the grace of God and watch out so that no poisonous root of bitterness grows up to trouble you, corrupting many. Now that's one of the most incredible passages of scripture in the New Testament. And why is it that we don't hear more on that subject? Why is it that we don't want to talk or think about our heavenly father loving us enough to make us uncomfortable for a moment so that he can change us and raise us up. My pastor, Apostle C, used to say, what if all of us were dressed suddenly here this morning with an outfit corresponding to our spiritual age? How many of us would have diapers on? How many of us would have a binky in our mouths, you know? This process, what, what, Paul, what, what the writer of <laughs> Hebrews is talking about is he's talking about the entire process by which our loving father brings us to a place of maturity from a place of immaturity. If you've ever met a 57-year-old, three-year-old, then you know what I'm talking about. It's not our best side that immature part of us, that ungrown up part, the part that complains, the part that whines, the, the part that needs to change. And so God, who loves us so much, he absolutely loves us as we are, but he has no plan for leaving us as we are. He will allow us to go through circumstances that are designed to bring out the best side of us, the mature side of us, the Christ-like side of us, and to leave off and to, and to starve out the weak side of us, the worst side of us. So that whole process is the process of maturity and it's the process of divine discipline and it's important. I don't know if you guys like the Dallas Cowboys here. We're 49er country, right? But the world famous Tom Landry was the great legendary coach of the Dallas Cowboys, and his, he's often quoted as saying that as a coach, his job is to make men do things that they don't want to do so that they can become the people that they always dreamed they could be. And I look at that and I say, I think that's a really good definition of divine discipline. Divine discipline is that process that we don't want to go through that enables us to become what we really want to be in the end. 
Some trainers say this, and maybe you've been to a gym and it's plastered on the wall. No pain, what? No gain, right? And so God knows this, and he loves us enough to allow us to be temporarily uncomfortable through things. Now, listen, if you're going through something uncomfortable, I'm not saying today that God is doing this to you. Not everything bad or everything difficult is something that God is doing to you, but it is something he's allowing. And there is purpose in it, and there's wisdom in it, and there's a way forward in it, and there's a way out of it, whatever you're going through. But sometimes what we're going through is designed to teach us something and to mature us and make us better than we actually are. Hebrews 12 calls this divine discipline. It's a spiritual conditioning process. It's an education process. It's teaching us sometimes things about ourselves that we don't want to see or experiences that we don't want to go through. It's called testing. It's called suffering. It's called trials. It's called afflictions. It's a lot of things in the Bible. But God always talks about how even in the heat, the gold is refined and purified. And that's what our Father is doing. There's gold on the inside of you, but he's refining you and I, isn't he? And, and it makes sense because doesn't our greatest growth in life come from the hardest times? How many know that's true? I've shared with you guys a couple times maybe, but some of you are new to Gateway. And so I'll, I'll take you back about 20 years ago to one of the hardest moments that Kathy and I and our team has ever gone through, which is that experience that we had trying to build a church right up the road here on Highway 101 at Yerba Buena on a place called Dove Hill. We were stuck in Willow Glen in a very inadequate building, an old building and too small. And so God laid it on our heart to find a place and Actually, when I started the process, I thought it would be a place just like this. I, I saw it in my mind that it would be like a, a commercial building. But at that time, commercial buildings were so, so expensive. We found a piece of land that was zoned for a church, amazingly, right here in Silicon Valley. And we took it as an answer to prayer. We took it as provision. And we worked on that property with the city hall, and we developed... Uh, designs and plans, and we poured a lot of money and a lot of time. We worked for about four and a half years on that, uh, on that uh, project. Some of you were there during that time. Time was against us. We were soon to be homeless because we had already sold our previous building, and time was getting away from it. There was delay after delay after delay, environmental issues and salamanders and butterflies and, we and weeds that couldn't, I mean, it was, it was like a nightmare, but all along the way, God would give us victory after victory, and every time we would have a victory, it felt like the Lord was just confirming his will even more, so we were getting more and more into this, and, what, and time was against us, and we, we got six weeks away from tractors moving dirt on Dove Hill. We raised the money, we had the plans approved, we had victory after victory, and the dot-com industry dropped in Silicon Valley. The entire, some of you guys were around during that time, 02, 03, people were losing their jobs. The economy was shaking. It was right after 9-11. There were situations that were worldwide that were impacting the real estate market, banking, and finance. And six weeks from us moving dirt on that project to build the home, that we were gonna to move to, the bank pulled back, made it almost impossible for us to proceed, and it was like the world came crashing down. I don't know if you've ever been involved in, in trying to do a business or get something done, and it just, in the end, it was getting so difficult, and that was one of the, the toughest experiences in my life. Now, what happened? We ended up here. And it was a God thing. We ended up with a building twice as big as what we were trying to build for half the price as what we were planning to spend. So in the end, you know, God knew what he was doing. And it, but I would always say when we were 
after that was over and a year passed, two years passed, five years, 10 years, I'm looking back on that just going, man, I do not know. It felt so right. It felt like that was going to happen and, and it just didn't. And I would say, Lord, I, you know, I'm good. I trust you. I know we're better. We're, we're good. We're fine. You know, nobody feels sorry for Gateway because we're in a great spot now. We got a 60,000 square foot building. We got seven locations. You know, we're, we're doing fine. But it was just looking back on that like, man, what was that? Have you ever had an experience like that? And I couldn't understand. And I would always say, one day, one day when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask God what happened, you know. You ever had an experience like that? Well, I want to tell you about how that story ends just a little bit later because I want to unpack for you what the Bible says about divine discipline. Maybe you'll write a few of these things down. First of all, uh, divine discipline is not punishment. When you go through something like that, it's easy to say, well, the Lord must be punishing me. But that is not at all what the Bible says. God is not trying to punish you for your sins. Jesus took your punishment on the cross. Say, so, well, last Saturday night I did something I shouldn't have done. Well, you shouldn't have done it. But God's not punishing you with sickness or punishing you with a hard time at work or punishing you with a tough time in your marriage because of some sin. Jesus took the punishment for your sins. Can I have a hallelujah? So God's not, the process is not God trying to pay you back. Divine discipline is not God paying you back. It's God drawing you back. So there are times where he'll reach out and pull you back closer to him. But it's not punishment. It may, it may not feel good, but it's not punishment. Our punishment for sin was laid on Jesus at the cross once and forever. And everyone that knows the Lord and loves the Lord said, Amen. Amen. Thank God for that. Divine discipline is for everybody. Divine discipline, if you are somebody thinking, I know, God's discipline is for somebody else. Uh, God's discipline is for the guy across the street. God's discipline is the guy that drives me crazy, but me, I'm a good guy. God knows. I don't need discipline. But the passage says that all of us need discipline. I need it, and so God deals with me, and he zeroes in on things with me, and there are times where I know I'm being scolded and I'm being taught and there's something in me that God is straightening out. And every single one of us needs to go through that process. Another thing about divine discipline is it makes us like Jesus. That's the goal. The Bible says it doesn't say that all the things that are happening are good, but it says there's something in Romans 8, something about the way all things work together that ends up being for good. And it produces that image of Christ in it. What does it say? For those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. You are in a process of being made like Jesus. And it reminds me of the old uh, story comes out of the South. There was, a, there was a, uh, an artist who was carving a horse out of stone, I believe it was. And it was taking a long time and he had that chisel and he had that hammer and he was chipping away and he had a neighbor that would come and check every so often. And every day he'd come and he could see a little bit more of that horse. Finally, the horse that the artist was creating was finished and the neighbor was amazed. He said, man, how did y'all do that? He said, well... I just chipped away everything that doesn't look like a horse. <laughs> and I think that's really relevant to this discussion today about divine discipline because God is an artist and he's working on you, my brother. He's working on you, my sister. And it may feel like, wow, he's really, he's rough. I mean, do it, does he really need a hammer? Does he really need a chisel? But what he's doing is he's taking everything out of our lives that doesn't look like Jesus. Amen. And in the end, that's the other thing about divine discipline is it, it's worth it in the end. Because the goal 
It's not suffering for no reason. It's not suffering like payback. It's not, God isn't trying to torture us. He's not a mean father. What he's doing is worth it in the end. Divine discipline proves that we are loved by God. What does the passage say? Can you think of a child whose father doesn't discipline him? Well, in our culture today, I think we could probably come up with a few children like that. But do you know how cruel it is not to discipline your children? It's the worst form of rejection that there is. To, to, to say to a child, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how you turn out. I don't care. I, it doesn't need to be any consequences. I'm not going to get in your face. I'm not going to talk to you. I'm not going to counsel you. I'm not going to straighten you out. You just go do it. Just go walk off a cliff if that's what you want to do. That's the worst kind of rejection. Really, when we set limits for our children and we talk to our children and we straighten them out when they need to be straightened out, that's love, isn't it? That's what love looks like because it, what it really saying is I'm not willing to send you out into a cruel, dark world unprepared to face it. My job is to get you ready to face the real world. I want you to succeed and I know you can succeed. So I'm gonna straighten you out on this issue. That's love. And even though it doesn't feel fun, it's the love of God that's ironing out and chipping away and sanding and smoothing so that we can stand not as immature, inexperienced, unready people in a cruel world, but God is getting ready to stand and not only stand, but to shine and reflect the image of his son, Jesus. So it is worth it in the end. Divine discipline is Worth it in the end. And let me just ask you this. Would you rather, maybe you're going through something right now. Maybe right today, you feel like, man, God is, he's dealing with me on something. And I wish it was over. Would you rather God left you alone? Do you wish that God would just take his hands off of you completely and just let ever, whatever's gonna happen, happen? It's the love of God protecting you and, and keeping it, even though you gotta take a little medicine right now, even though you gotta have a little time out right now, it's straightening something out in you so that you can stand strong when the real battles come. And that's the love of God. And it's so worth it in the end. Hebrews says that it's good for us. It says we're gonna share in his holiness one day. It says we're gonna have a life of peace. Afterward, there will be peace a peaceful harvest of right living. And isn't that what we want? Isn't that the life we want? Don't we want a life of peace and maturity where God is able to use us? That's the life. And it hinges on, it all hinges on our response. So with the few minutes I have left, I wanna talk right to you if you're going through something right now. And I wanna give you three responses that you can have to divine discipline. It's too late to decide if you want divine discipline because you're going to get it because God loves you, right? So maybe the real question is, so how, what do I do? How, how do I respond when I know God is after something in me? Let me give you three possible responses. The first one is we can bitterly resent divine discipline. We can get mad. We can get angry. And we can become bitter. In fact, the passage we read about divine discipline warns us specifically, hey, get your hands up, strengthen yourself, and don't get bitter. Because it says the bitterness will defile you. And it's something, isn't it, about how when we go through hard times, a switch can go off it's very easy, we can get angry. We can become angry with God, angry with people. If a man hurts you, you get angry with all men. If a woman hurts you, you get angry with all women. You become bitter, and ultimately you can become bitter against life. Naomi said that in the book of Ruth. She said, call me bitter. Think of it, just call me bitter. This is now my identity. I've been through a famine. I've been through loss. I've been through too much. Not long ago, one of our elders 
posted something on social media, and it was, uh, it was about the Supreme Court decision, uh, Roe versus Wade. A lot of us were very excited about that. He posted something, you know, positive. And somebody chimed in on that as only, as only happens on social media. They did a rant. I mean, it was a deep, long rant. It was a vicious, horrible, dark, twisted. It wasn't like I see it differently. It was you're the worst person in the world. I want nothing to do with you. I want nothing to do with Christ. I want nothing to do with your evangelical church. I want. It went on and on and on. It was so dark, and I was so surprised to read that the author used to be in our church, used to sit in Kathy's Sunday school class, grew up. In fact, his parents were elders in our church. They've moved away. And I thought, I couldn't even recognize this child who used to worship Jesus and love the Lord, and now he was anti-Jesus, anti-church, anti... It was like breathtaking. I don't It wasn't like he disagreed. It was like I couldn't recognize him. And I thought, what, what happened to this little boy who used to be in our Sunday school class? What happened was God started to deal with things in him, and he got bitter. And that bitterness will so change your marriage. It'll, it'll change every friendship. It'll change. And so we cannot allow the difficulties of life to make us bitter. That's the wrong response. If we reject divine discipline, it makes us bitter, not better. The second possibility is we can drag our feet in divine discipline. To be honest with you, that's what I did for years concerning Dove Hill. Now, you wouldn't have known it because I soldiered through and I kept a stiff upper lip and all that, but man, I was not having fun and I had beef with God. Not, not like angry beef, not like bitter beef, but just like, hey, God, come on. Did you have to do it that way? Have you ever had that experience? And just my, just my raising a question politely, one day in heaven, I know he'll explain to me, that was a form of complaint. It was a form of dragging my feet like, okay, I'll go along with it, God, but I wish this wasn't happening. And to be honest, that's not appropriate because when you're going through a hard time, if you really understand that God is allowing it and he's doing something good in your life, if you're crossing your arms and holding God at a distance. Okay, I'll go along with it. I mean, I, you know, I'm not gonna go postal. I'm not gonna like, you know, kill people in my neighborhood or anything, but, and we think we're justified because we're holding it together even though God is really mistreating us, but we're still righteous and holy. That's called dragging your feet. Have you ever done that? Remember I told you that I would always say, I have no idea why God did this. Let me finish the story. One morning, this is about five years ago, I woke up and I'm not a spooky person, but I, I believe in the Holy Spirit and I, I have encounters with the Holy Spirit. And if you read the Bible, people that love God have encounters with the Holy Spirit. And I woke up and I was encountering the Holy Spirit and it came to me just like this. This is what I heard and felt. As soon as I opened my eyes, the Lord said, you always say that you don't know what I did at Dove Hill. I want you to go downstairs, get a piece of paper and a pen, and write down, because I'm going to tell you what I did. <laughs> I brewed a pot of French roast... I sat in my chair, and I, I mean, I knew I was in the presence of God. And here's what the Lord said to me. I humbled you. And I went, I said, you did a good job. <laughs> not, not that I'm humble, 
but that it wrecked me. It, it humbled me. And he explained, he said, there are things I'm doing now in you that I could not have done had I not brought you through that. And there are things that I yet want to do that you're not ready for, and I had to do that to prepare you to help you to be what I need you to be, to do what I've called you to do. And I broke, and all the foot dragging stopped. And that's when I learned the third response, to receive it, to embrace divine discipline, to say, Lord, this hurts but I trust you. And you know what I've learned through these years serving the Lord? I've I've still got a lot of things to learn. It's not like I'm an expert, but here's one thing that's really clear in my mind. When hard things happen, because they do, Jesus promised you, in this world, you're gonna have trouble. I was just reading this morning that Paul the Apostle went through a shipwreck. I was trying to remember, was that before he was beaten with 40 stripes or was that after? Just because you love the Lord doesn't mean you know, you're going to get a pass from all the hardship in life, right? The promise is he'll be with us and that he'll use that for our good. So I, I've learned to stop saying, why did this happen? Because that's the foot dragging. Like, if I agree with you, God, th- then it'll be okay. If I understand you, God, then I can sign on. You don't need to understand. So the prayer for me is no longer, why is this happening? Here's the prayer. What are you teaching me? Not why is this happening? Lord, what do I need to understand right now? Because I know you're a good father. I know you're a good father. I know you're doing something good in me. What do I need to do right now? Just wait on you? Just... Just get through it. Is there something I need to learn? Because I've noticed that God is light on the explanations. But he's heavy on the grace. And says, take care of each other is what it says. Watching each other so that you don't fail the grace of God. There's a grace for going through the trial and there's a grace to learn and grow and become strong and stand tall. Even when it hurts so much, that grace will help you. You can get through anything, I promise you, when God's grace is there. But you can't have grace if you're mad. And you can't have grace from a place of trying to evaluate what kind of a job God is doing. Grace only comes when you humble yourself and say, okay, Lord, I'm the student, you're the teacher. You don't answer to me. You don't have to answer my questions. Just teach me, teach me what I need to know. And in that, we begin to experience the life, the life of the, of the bad things being removed from us and nothing but the good things being left in us. Does anybody understand what I'm saying here today? Talking about divine discipline, so here it is. It doesn't feel good. It doesn't last forever. Everyone needs it. God loves us enough to do it to us. And if we receive it, we become his sons and daughters. Amazing, right? He's a loving, gracious father. Let's pray to him right now. Father, I thank you for this time to be together in your word. I thank you for the beautiful 12th chapter of Hebrews. There's so much there that you want to say to us. So much there that the Holy Spirit is speaking to different people, people watching online, people watching weeks or months from now, people that are in this room right now. I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to come alongside every person that's struggling, every person that's in a hard time. It's not easy, Lord. But I pray your grace. And I pray, Lord, that we wouldn't be bitter that we wouldn't get angry and resentful, but instead we would realize that you're a loving father. 
And that even when we don't understand, you're still loving. You're still gracious and we trust you, Lord. Lord, I thank you for our example, Jesus, who experienced the cross and he endured it. And he's our North Star to help us when we're struggling, to help us when the nails are piercing our hands and the wounds are in our side. Let every person that's going through a death begin to experience your resurrection, Lord, and your faithfulness and your grace. Thank you that you loved us enough to cleanse us of our sins and take our punishment, Jesus, on the cross. And I pray right now, Lord, if, if sin is separating any of us from you, if we're away from you somehow, Maybe we got mad. Maybe we walked away. Or maybe we never knew. Wash our sins, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. And reconnect us to your incredible love that's in Christ. Just heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Is that you? You're away from God? Something happened. I don't believe it's an accident that you're here today. I think it's God's love. He's your father. Will you open your heart to him? Will you do it right now? Let's all just say a prayer. Just say it out loud. Whether you've been around for 100 years or you've never known Christ, just, just say this prayer with me. Just say, Father God, Thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sins. I want to be your child. I receive your love. From this day forward, I'll serve you. Thank you for saving me.